That's what I'm talking about. We're either going to get vibed or revived or something before this day is over with. Are you happy to be in God's house? If you ain't happy to be in God's house, raise your hand. Uh -huh, Sam. <laughs> we, we got some work to do, brother. Come on, we got to go see her. Oh, everyone said, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash away? Son of God? Yes. Have you asked him to forgive you of your sin? Yes. You'll get seated right here. Okay. Miss Mary, upon your profession of faith that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. See, you make sure that you pick up a bulletin. It's a lot of things that's going to start be taking place. And 
and uh, that you just need to be mindful of. One, you see this morning that we are starting a revival. Brother Al and Miss Sandy's back with us, and we're glad to see them and, and excited about that. This morning we'll have the service here in the sanctuary, and then tonight we'll move out into the fellowship hall. It'll be if, if those that have, it was <coughs> been coming, you know, and if not, we're going to go out in the fellowship hall, and you're able to sit there, and you can get you a cup of coffee. You'll be able to bring something to write down on and take notes or whatever, and for the rest of the week, uh, we'll be out in the fellowship hall at 6 o'clock every night in that so just being mindful of that invite somebody you know somebody uh, I know I've had uh, a few people have told me that they're coming from other churches we wouldn't want to take them away from their church this morning but they are invited to come for the rest of the week it's a good time it's a good time to learn never never get to a point that we we're not able to learn so just remember tonight at six o'clock we'll be in the fellowship hall also it's thing you'll see if you see up on the screen over here we're going to start the experience and guide study next Sunday <laughs> night at 6 p.m. so if you haven't signed up uh, can they can they still sign up uh, we might have to share a book you know uh, I'll, I'll give somebody my book if you come I'll share it with Tammy I know she'll let me sit close to her and I ain't going to talk to her <laughs> so, but we don't we don't want you to miss we don't want you to miss out on that if she don't let me, I'm going to sit by somebody else. So. The, the, books, the books will be in, and, and we'll be ready for Sunday night uh, coming on that. So that's going to be a great time on that, to just be able to, to experience that and go through that Bible study. Uh, that's pretty much everything that I see. I think Leslie has something she wants to mention this morning. I would second that. Uh, pray about that. You know, as I come on Wednesday nights and I see the children, they're running and they're all excited about getting next door over here and want to to be a part of that. So uh, it's it's a blessing. You know, we're always wondering about well, how we're going to grow the church, how we're going to do this, how we're going to do that. It starts right there. Amen. You know, you want you want them to go up and. and be in children's church, you want them to grow up and be in the youth, you want them to grow up and be a part of the church, you want them to be, grow up and be all a part of the church, that's how it starts out there. And if you find that we're slacking on that end, so what does that say? So just be in prayer for that, that, that more will come. Like you said, if you sign up on that, you won't be doing it every Wednesday, and it's just a rotation. The Lord will use you if you're willing to be used, and the Lord will bless you for that too also. So just be mindful of that. So do we have any other announcements, Miss Sherry? You know me, I got a I got a shuffle up here. here. <laughs> uh, I went to the re the regional meeting yesterday for the kickoff for shoe boxes. I learned a little bit more than I knew. I also learned that the shoe boxes come with a, a, a salvation plan book. And they also the ones that accepted have a twelve week program that teaches them, like, like our Bible school, that teaches them how to become a Christian, how to, how, to, how to do that. So it's a little more involved than we all think it is. It's a shoe box, but that's a way to get in the door. And I uh, saw some videos that were sad, but happy. And uh, I'm looking at my stuff, I'm getting it together, but I, I would like to have, of course, donations, of course, but some of the older girls, some sewing kits. If anybody's got a lot of extra sewing stuff, sewing kits, clothespins, uh, feminine.
products, uh, still girl toys and boy toys. Those are our main things right now. So I appreciate it. All right. Amy. Oh, and as to about our services this week, uh, Wednesday night we'd like to plan on having a little fellowship. And uh, for those that are interested in making something, preparing it, maybe it's soup and sandwiches along that order, something simple uh, for Wednesday night. So we shall just encourage you to come and enjoy the Bible study and also have the fellowship. Any, anyone else? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we continue on with the service this morning. Father, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we come to you, Lord, this morning. Lord, we come to you telling we love you, Lord, for what you've already done, Lord, and what you're doing right now, Lord, and what you plan to do. And, Father, we just pray for each one that's here this morning. We pray for those that are not able to be here. We pray for those, Lord, that will see it in the way of the Internet, Lord. God, we pray for those that are shut in, Lord, that's not able, Lord, that you would lift them up and encourage them as well this morning. Father, Lord, we thank you for Brother Al and Miss Sandy. We thank you for their ministry, Lord. We ask you to continue to use them and bless them in a mighty way as they come to present the gospel, Lord. Lord, the truth of what's going to take place, how it's going to take place, Lord, and all those things, Lord, as we study. Father, I just ask you that you would be with the church, Lord. God, I pray, Lord, right now, Lord, that you would lay it on the hearts of individuals, Lord, for the Wednesday night with the children, Lord. God, we stand in the need of that, Lord, and we know that, Lord, that you can touch hearts, Lord, that nobody else can touch. Lord, what a blessing it is to serve you, Lord. Father, we just pray, Lord, that you would minister to us, Lord. Help us to be the church. Not say we're a church, but be the church, Lord. Help us in that. Lord, I ask you to just continue to be with those that are sick and suffering, Lord. Families that's lost loved ones, comfort them. Lift the families up, Lord, and encourage them. Father, we just thank you for the day that we have today that we can come to gather in your name and worship. Father, through song, Lord, in the time of song service, we ask you to be with Brother Tyler and those that play, those that sing, Lord. God, I pray, Lord, that it would be a joyful noise, Lord. And it would be praises to a holy and awesome and mighty God. Father, we just ask you to be Brother Al as he comes this morning to bring the word, Lord, and, and show us the word, Lord, and God explain the word to us. We just ask you to use him, Lord, fill him with your spirit this morning. Be with the time of invitation, Lord. God, so many times, Lord, we look and think it's just a time that if you're lost, you have to come down, Lord, and we do want that. But, Lord, there's so many things that we can come, Lord, to you about. We ask you, Lord, just deal with our hearts this morning. Forgive us where we failed you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. 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 I'm excited. I don't know if y'all know it or not. I'm excited this morning. It feels good to see the smiling faces. I have looked over churches a bunch of times and saw people with I'm so happy to be here in church. But y'all ain't like that. So, but I also talk about the rough end times. Let's stand up. Jesus is coming soon. Let's sing like he's coming. Here we go. Troublesome times are here.
coming soon, they must have power. Where's that power we get? That power in the blood. Amen. The only thing that saves us is power in the blood.
decision. We gotta quit worrying about what tomorrow holds and don't Jesus holds. Let's get back to the heart of worship. And it's not about anybody up here. It's not about this great band that plays that I'm so proud of or choir that you up here. The preacher is preaching. It's all about Jesus. When the music fades and all is stripped away, and I sing. When you're up against a wall And your mountain seems so tall And you realize life's not always fair You can run away and hide Let the old man decide 
or you can change your circumstances with a prayer when everything falls apart praise his name when you have a broken heart raise your hands and say Lord you're all I need you're everything to me and you'll take the pain away when it seems you're all alone praise his name when you feel you can't go home raise your hands and say greater is he that is within me and you can praise the hurt away if you just praise his name As Brother Al is setting up the, uh, the screen and everything, I'm so glad you're here today. Uh, I know many of you have seen Brother Al come here over the last several years as we do this uh, Bible prophecy study. See all the babies. We do have a nursery if you need it. We do have a nursery if you need it back there. Uh, thank the Lord for Children's Church. I didn't get a count on them, but it's a bunch. It's a bunch. Brother Tyler's been going back there, and he's been working with them, teaching them some songs, and um, we're getting ready. I, I, you know, above everything that you can do, above all your sacrifices and everything else, it's obedience to God. It's very important that we're obedient to the Word of God. And the only way you're going to know the Word of God is to uh, bring forth the bread of life, which is the Scriptures, those Bibles. Matter of fact, if you, if you don't have a Bible, 
I want you to remember now, we, we keep Bibles in the back. We give out hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Don't ever be embarrassed, something like that. We have Bibles for you to be able to read and study. Now, tonight when we come, at, uh, it'll be 6 o'clock. Uh, we'll be meeting in the fellowship hall, all right? And hopefully somebody will make some coffee. Maybe some of y'all want to make some brownies. I think I lost some weight with this kidney stone here lately. <laughs> um, but I, I still got my tie tucked in. I don't even, Tedra, you know I can't. <laughs> I'm so jealous. Eddie come up to me today. He's shaking a little medicine bottle like that. <laughs> he had a big old kidney stone. I passed this the other day. I'm like, oh, Lord, if he can pass it, surely I can. Then he told me the secret. Y'all going to see me out there. If y'all need some firewood, I'm going to go get me a chainsaw. I'm going to go crank up a chainsaw. But uh, Lord is good. I want y'all to pray for Brother Al as he serves the Lord. Uh, he's, he's been a blessing to us over the last many years. Uh, ever since I've been in ministry, I've been u- utilizing him and stuff. But uh, pray for him, because I know Satan wouldn't want to stop this, and you see the signs of the times. So, Brother Al, would you come and present the gospel? Amen. And uh, let's all pray for him. Come here right here. Amen. And uh, I, I'd kind of like to preach from right here, if that's all right. <laughs> that's, it might be better for them. <laughs> let's pray for him in the name of Jesus right now. Father, we thank you so much today as we gather together as the body of Jesus Christ, Father, for the words that you've already prepared for us in the Bible. I thank you for Brother Al's call upon his life as he presents, and uh, he opens our eyes to all the things that you have shared with him, Father. Lord, may our hearts be receptive, Father. May we receive the word with gladness, Father. May we never be afraid, but, Lord, in boldness, walk out in this old dark world, shouting, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. I thank you so much for Miss Mary today with her baptism, Father. As she serves you, may it bring glory unto you, Father. May may others see uh, Christ in her life, Father. And as she walks in the newness of life, Father, I pray, Father, that, Lord, she'll have the peace that passes understanding. In Jesus' name we pray it all. Amen. 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 Well, good morning. It's good to be back over here with you dear people. It's, uh, it's always a joy for me and Sandy to come here and, and uh, see Brother Blaine, Miss Tadra, and all of you. It's... Uh, we we kind of kind of feel like home folks now when we come. We've been here several times, and um, it's been a real blessing for us over the years. I can tell you that right now. But uh, I greet you this morning in the blessed name of Jesus, our Savior. Uh, to God be the glory for all that He has done and is going to do. This week we're going to be talking about Bible prophecy things that God's Word has told us is going to come to pass. Some of it has already happened. Some of it is in the process of happening, and some is still futuristic. But we're going to be covering a lot of ground in a lot of different places of the Bible. Uh, this week, Somebody asked me this morning, are you going to be preaching from Revelation? I said, yeah, yeah, we're going to be preaching from Revelation. Truth is, we're going to be preaching from Genesis to Revelation. We're going to be looking all over the Bible. But... Um, I hope you'll come back. Now, this is a, what you hear this morning would be a little bit of a sampling of the teachings that we're going to be doing this week as we uh, look at some things that are happening today that point to the imminent return of Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. So, with that being said, I uh, would ask you, if you will, I know you just got seated there, but I'll ask you if you wouldn't mind to stand with me to honor the reading of God's Word. We're going to get to it in just a minute. But before we read this, if you'll just listen, I want to begin this morning by telling you a little story. There was a farmer, and he had been very successful in his endeavors and had become quite rich at his farming enterprises. And one year, he was uh, especially successful with his crop. His fields yielded what would be a really bountiful bumper crop for him. But he had a problem. And his problem was that his barns weren't big enough to hold such a big crop. And so as he thought for a solution, he decided that he would simply tear down these old barns that he had and he would build some larger warehouses to hold this big bumper crop. And so that's what he did. And his solution seemed to work quite well. Uh, He had several warehouses filled to the very brim with all of this produce. 
and he was very satisfied with his accomplishments, and he thought to himself, well, I've labored real hard. I've got plenty to last me now for years, and so now I'm just going to sit back and relax and eat, drink, and be merry. But on the very day that he said that to himself, God spoke to him, and God said, you fool. Huh. He said, this very night, I'm going to require your soul. That is to say, I'm going to kill you and take you out of this world. And then, who is all this stuff that you've accumulated going to benefit? Well, I know that if you've read your Bible very much, you recognize the story, don't you? It was a parable that Jesus himself told to his disciples. And it was more than just for entertainment. Because you see, with a parable, there's always a deeper spiritual meaning than just the entertainment value of the story that's being told. And so this story has a deeper truth to it. And we're going to look at that this morning. Let's begin, though, by reading as it's written in the Scriptures, okay? Now, I'm reading from Luke chapter 12, verse 16. It begins this way, And he, talking about Jesus, spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, drink, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your holy word. Father, where would we be without the written word of God? We would be in such darkness and confusion. But there is so much, an infinite amount, in fact, of things that we can learn and need to learn from your word. Thank you for this parable that Jesus told. May we uh, squeeze it and get everything we can out of it today, Lord. May it be a blessing to us for having read and studied and exhorted people with your word. Go with us now, Lord, as we continue in this message. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. You may be seated. Listen, as I was reading this story, I began to think, now, God obviously got really mad at this guy. He called him a fool. But why? As I read the story, I really didn't see anything in it that would seemed to be something that would cause God to be angry at someone. Well, let's just look at the facts, if we can, for a moment. First of all, we see that this was a rich man. Now, I know that Jesus said that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter into heaven. I understand that. But he said, with, all, with God, all things are possible. And there's nothing sinful about being rich, unless, of course, you know, you gained all your possessions and wealth by hurting other people. Now, that's a different story. But here was a guy that was a farmer, a good farmer, and he had done quite well. And there's nothing wrong with that. Secondly, we see that he was faced with a problem. His barns weren't big enough to hold his bumper crop, and maybe, as I said, maybe his barns were old. Maybe they needed to be replaced anyway. So he decides to tear them down and build some bigger warehouses to hold this great big crop. Now, to me, that seems like a very reasonable solution to the problem. He couldn't just let this crop rot in the field, so, you know, he got rid of the old buildings and built something that would suffice, something that would do the job for him. Now, what's wrong with that, I ask you? You see, I don't see anything evil or sinful or any way wrong with a decision that, that would cause it to be such an offense to God. So still, I haven't discovered why was God so angry with this man. Then after all of his labors with his bigger barns filled enough with enough produce to last him for many years, 
He looks at what he's got and he says to himself, you know, I've got plenty. I've got more than enough to last me for many, many years to come. And so now I think I'll just sit back and relax and enjoy the fruits of all my hard labor. Again, I ask you, is there anything wrong with that idea? You know, let me ask you this, uh, this way. If you think that setting money aside for your years of retirement is bad, I'll be glad to take your retirement savings off your hands, okay? I'll help you out with that problem. You know, there's nothing wrong with us setting aside money for knowing that we're going to need that financial assistance later on in life. And so, you know, I kind of think about that bumper sticker I've seen a lot of times on these, you know, big, huge RVs where it says, spending my kid's inheritance. Here was a guy that wasn't thinking about his kids. He was just thinking about spending that money on himself. But he really wasn't being greedy. Now, if he was really greedy, he probably would have said, I'm going to keep working. I'm going I'm to build even more barns and I'm, you know, have more crops. But he didn't do that. He said what? He said, I've got plenty. No need for me to continue with this. So as far as I can see, there wasn't anything sinful or greedy or really so atrocious about his attitude. There's nothing in the story that indicates that, you know, he took advantage of other people in his climbing the ladder of success. But God said to that man, you're a fool. Now, in the original language, that word that we have translated as fool is quite, quite a remark. It's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like maybe in English we would say, you're an idiot. What in the world is wrong with you? See, it's, it's, it's emphatic in its meaning. It's very harsh words for, for someone who seemed to be doing normal stuff. I didn't see where he had really done anything against God. But obviously there was something, wasn't there? Or God wouldn't have responded that way. So I ask you the question one more time, why was God so angry with this man? Well, the Lord himself explains why in the very next verse, which I intentionally did not read to this time. Verse 21, Jesus said, So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. You see, the great sin that this rich farmer committed was simply this. In everything he did, he ignored God. It wasn't that he was fighting against God. It wasn't that he was, you know, an atheist, although he may have been. He was a man who was just consumed with himself and building his own enterprise. He never considered God. He never thanked God for that big crop. He, he never honored God with his wealth. He never thought about how he might help those who were less fortunate than him by sharing some of what he had with those people. He never did any of those things. He just went about his self-centered business ignoring God altogether. As a result, God called him a fool. I said, as a result, God called this man a fool. And I wanted to tell you, and I'm not being, you know, uh, facetious. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings in any way, but there are a lot of fools probably sitting in this room who are guilty of the same, the same sin that this man committed. So God called him a fool. And he said to him, you're going to die tonight. I heard a guy say this from the pulpit one time, and it kind of stuck with me for some reason. But he said, you know, when you put your shoes on this morning, you don't know but what the mortician will be taking them off tonight. Every day, 
any day we could leave this world and go into eternity. And then he says, so what is, what, what is all this wealth, all this stuff you put so much energy and effort into, what is it going to do for you then? Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What profit? Now let me tell you something. Now listen carefully. God's trying to get your attention. And mine. I put myself in the same boat with this passage. Before we make the same mistake, before we do what the rich man did, in fact, I believe that God's going to speak directly to your heart and to mine this very morning. We live in a very, very exciting time since the time Jesus walked the hills of Galilee and the streets of Jerusalem. The next great event in the church age in which you and I live in is perhaps the greatest event of the entire church age outside of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Himself. And that event is the rapture of the church where the Lord will come and gather up all of His people and together He will take them out of this world and carry us back to heaven where He is preparing some wonderful stuff for us. 1 Thessalonians 4, 6, Paul said it this way, that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Hallelujah. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Those are comforting thoughts for those who, who are right with God and ready to meet Him. Amen? Yeah. In Titus chapter 2, verse 11, it says that we should be looking for that blessed hope in the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We should be expecting it, anticipating it, talking about it, preaching it from the pulpits. But not only should Christians be aware of this glorious fact that Jesus is coming for His church, but even those who are not Christians need to realize that he's coming because the Bible declares that those who are not gathered out in the rapture will be left behind to face the worst time in all of human history on this planet. The heartache, the suffering, the bloodshed, the warfare, the crime, the divine plagues that God pours out on the planet will be unheard of. It's never happened this way before. So even non-Christians need to recognize that if His coming is near, as we were preaching, that their time in this world is dwindling to away, their time to turn to Christ and become a born-again believer is getting ever shorter. So as I said a moment ago, today, for us Christians, for those of us who are longing to see our Lord face to face, this is an exciting time. You know, I... Brother, I, I, really, uh, I really appreciate God calling me to this ministry to preach about the return of Christ. It's an exciting topic. Now, of course, in my preaching, I, I really get into a lot of things, hopefully all from the Bible. You know, I preach hard against sin, and I try to be an encouragement to God's people but I am blessed that God has specifically called me to tell people that Jesus is coming for His people. Get ready. And so here I am this morning telling you Jesus is coming. Get ready. And you may be thinking, well, Brother Al, what makes you think that? How is God telling us that He's coming soon? You see, even though God has not told us the exact day that he's going to come. We don't know that. He does give us a lot of signs in his word that he's told us that we should be looking for, and when we see those things happening, it can tell us that his coming is getting near. Now, that's what he said. And he describes a lot of those signs, and according to Luke 21, 28, he said, and when these things begin, notice the word begin, 
when you see them starting to happen, when these things begin to come to pass, then look up your, look, lift up your heads and, and the Lord is coming near. I messed that up, didn't I? Look up and lift up your heads for my, your redemption draweth nigh. In fact, the Lord was so specific and detailed about what we needed to look for that he said we wouldn't have to even guess about it or wonder about it or be, you know, confused about it. He said we could know when it's near. Do you believe the Bible? Do you believe that's what the Lord said? Do you believe we can actually know that it's getting very close? In Matthew 24, verse 33, he said, When you shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. And so I'm here this morning to tell you, as never before in all of history, the signs of his coming are happening everywhere. Literally dozens and dozens of signs that were prophesied many, many years ago in the Bible that are all happening right now simultaneously. This is a unique time in history. This has never happened before. Now, I don't have time for us to look at all of the signs, but allow me to share with you this morning, if I can, just a few of the signs that I think are some of the more major ones, the ones that we can really grasp, we can see it happening. Here's some of the signs that I believe that should shake us into the reality that Jesus is coming soon. The first one I title it this, I call it the regathering. The regathering of the Jewish people. You see in 70 AD the Roman legions under the leadership of General Titus destroyed the city of Jerusalem and they killed, according to Josephus, the Jewish historian, they killed over a million Jews and deported some 97,000 Jews from Jerusalem and scattered them over the entire empire as slaves. And for over 1,800 years, 1,800 years, the Jews were dispersed and homeless people. They had no national homeland. But God had said the day would come when he would bring them back to their ancient homeland. One of my favorite verses in that respect is Isaiah 11, Verse 11, and it says, And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people which shall be left. In verse 12 it says, And he shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. He's going he's to make Israel like a magnet and all the Jews around the world, ten, tiny particles of metal, and they're going to be just pulled. They're going to come from every direction back to the land. This prophecy began to be fulfilled in the late 1800s with the beginning of what we call today the Zionist movement under the direction of a man called Theodore Herzl in which they encouraged the Jewish people to move back to their ancient homeland of Israel and gradually Jews from all over the world began to immigrate back to the land of their forefathers, the land of Israel. There were about 60,000 Jews in the land of Israel by the time 1917 rolled around, you know, right in the middle of World War I. By the time they became a nation in 1948, there was over 716,000 Jews in the land. And according to the, to the numbers gathered in 2021, there are now 6.9 million Jews in the land of Israel. And they're still coming back. They're still flooding back to their land. In fact, did you know that they're even leaving the United States of America to go to Israel and live there? I'm talking about the Jewish people. They are. In fact, it's at a rate of about 2,000 a year. About 2,000 Jews every year leave America to go live in the land of Israel. Some might think, well, are they crazy? Why would they leave the land of opportunity to go to a place that's plagued with terrorism? Hmm, do I look like Benny? 
I think there's a little terrorism going on in this country as well, and I don't see people leaving for that reason. You know, many times when we're in Israel, I've asked Americans who have, who have made aliyah, that's the word, uh, aliyah means, it's Hebrew means to go up. And so they use that word to describe going back to the land. And there are many Americans who've made aliyah to the land of Israel, and sometimes when I'm over there and I run into the one, I'll ask him, I said, you know, why did you leave America to come and live in Israel? America's supposed to be the land of opportunity, right? But you know, what I found that using different words, most of them give me the same answer. Most of them will say something like this. I don't know for sure. I just felt like this is my home, that this is where I need to be. And I felt a pull to come back to this land. You see, they don't understand it. They don't read the scriptures. They don't know why they're going back per se. But I know why. Because God said the day would come when he would start gathering the Jews back to their land. And by the way, that Zionist movement, that immigration back to the land of Israel is ongoing, and there's a lot more that's going to go back before it's all said and done. But not only did God say he would bring them back, he also said that when he got them back, that he would make them into a nation again. Ezekiel 37, 21, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land, and I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. At 4 o'clock in the afternoon on May 14, 1948, Mr. David Ben-Gurion, the man who would become the first prime minister of Israel, stood in what is now called Independence Hall in Tel Aviv. And there Mr. Ben-Gurion read the Declaration of Independence for the modern state of Israel. The very next morning, May 15, 1948, Israel was attacked by five Arab nations. Israel was fighting against incredible odds. To every Jewish soldier, there were 40 Arab soldiers fighting against it. In the Arab nations, they had all kinds of weaponry for modern military. The Jews practically had no weapons to defend themselves. But after 10 months of warfare, the Arabs called for a truce and Israel stood with sovereign borders. And today, some 74 years later, she still stands. Not because of her military might, but simply because God said the day would come when he would bring the Jews back to their land, he would make them into a nation, and all the powers of the Arab nations or the whole world are not going to stop God when he says he's going to do something. After 1948, even though Israel was then a nation, a sovereign state, her critics claimed that there was no way that she could build an economic system, an economy that would, that would survive in that dry, barren wasteland called Israel. Now that's what they said, but God says something differently. You see, God prophesied long ago through the prophet Isaiah, according to chapter 27, verse 6, He shall cause them that come of Jacob, that's the Jews, to take root. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. Isaiah 35, verse 1. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. As the rose. Listen to me. Since 1948, when the modern state of Israel was birthed, and for the last 74 years, Israel has not only survived, she has thrived. And today when you go there, instead of looking like a dry, barren wasteland, it almost looks like the Garden of Eden. Beautiful crops growing everywhere. She is doing quite well. 
her economy is strong and growing. Today, tiny Israel is a high-tech giant. Many tech, high-tech leaders like uh, Intel and Microsoft and Apple have built their first overseas research centers in Tel Aviv, Israel. They recognize the forward-thinking, innovative thinking of the Israelis. Agriculturally, Israel has turned the land into a paradise of vegetables and fruits of all kinds. Today, you can, you can find practically every vegetable and every fruit growing in Israel somewhere. She produces 95% of her own food consumption and exports over $3 billion in fruits and vegetables each year tiny little country, one of the few in the world who grows more food than they can consume. Since 2010, Israel has discovered approximately 32 trillion cubic feet of natural gas reserves just off the coast of Haifa in the Mediterranean Sea. That's enough natural gas to last Israel for 100 years, even with exporting gas to other nations. Now you add all of that to the billions of dollars that they bring in through diamond exports, the billion dollar tourism industry and hundreds of other types of commerce and I'm telling you it's amazing what God has done in such a small piece of property over there called Israel. Now all of that may seem relatively immaterial to you but when you think about Israel and the size of Israel it's a miracle, to say the least. You see, Israel is a very, very tiny nation. It's actually less than a third, one-third the size of my home state of Louisiana. It's not a very big country. But for 74 years, God has placed His hand on the land and taken it out of a divinely induced hibernation, you might say, and suddenly things are growing like they've never grown before. Now, there are a lot of other prophecies of the Lord's imminent return. For example, there's the prophecy of the third temple. I'm going to talk more extensively about that sometime this week. In Daniel chapter 9, the scriptures tell us that the coming Antichrist will, at the, at the midpoint of the tribulation, desecrate the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. But of course today there is no Jewish temple in, in Jerusalem. Don't get confused between a synagogue and a temple. There are many synagogues. There's only one temple place. The temple is on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, Mount Moriah. But the Apostle Paul also wrote about the sinful act that the Antichrist would commit in 2 Thessalonians 2.4 where, where Paul writes that the Antichrist will oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God, listen to this, sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. So there's going to be a third temple. There's not one today, but it's happening. It's going to come. And it will be operating during the tribulation. We could call it the third temple, the coming temple. We could call it the tribulation temple. Because that's where the Antichrist will commit his abominable sin. Tells me that the tribulation must be getting pretty close if we can see things preparing for the building of that temple. Would you agree with that idea? Today, there are several temple movement organizations in Israel that are working very hard to prepare for the construction of their third temple. Again, I'm just kind of touching on it a little bit this morning. I, I hope I can give you a lot more details about it later one night this week. They've already built the extremely expensive furniture that goes in it. You remember well, just one piece of that furniture is called the menorah. Well, that's that seven lamp lamp stand. There's over two and a half million dollars worth of gold in that one piece. They've already got it built. In fact, it's on display in Jerusalem on public display. It's outside in a some kind of a fiberglass enclosure. Of course, there's all kinds of alarms and things with it, but you can actually go there and see it. 
They've constructed the millions of dollars worth of vessels used in all the sacrificial rituals, things that are made out of gold and silver, and precious stones. They've made the priestly garments and the musical instruments. And listen to this, using DNA testing to determine which Jewish men are from the tribe of Levi, they've now determined which Jewish men are qualified to be the priests in the new temple, and they've established a registry for them. And today they are training them in the local yeshivas. A yeshiva is the same thing as what we would call a seminary. They even have the perfect sacrificial red heifer that will be used in the cleansing ritual to prepare the construction workers so they can walk up on that holy ground where the temple stood and begin to build there. Now, I'll explain all that more maybe later, later this week. So if we can see the preparation being made for the third temple, the tribulation temple, it means that we're getting close to the tribulation. And since the rapture precedes the tribulation, it means we're even closer to the rapture. Let's go on. The Bible teaches us in the prophecies of Daniel chapter 2 that during the tribulation, the Antichrist will rule over a European-based empire of nations that will eventually extend its control over the entire planet. God revealed to Daniel that that final empire of the age will be a continuation of the ancient Roman Empire. And therefore, we sometimes refer to that coming empire as the revived Roman Empire. That seems to be an impossibility because, listen, throughout the centuries, the nations of Europe have continually warred against one another, culminating in two world wars in just the last century that all were focused on Europe. But after World War II, with Europe devastated by the war, the nations voluntarily began to work together on various trade treaties that could help them rebuild their economies. And as more and more countries were added to this conglomerate of nations, the treaties increased their power to control not only the trade deals, but practically every aspect of life, politically, economically, and socially. Today, there are 27 European nations that form the new empire. It's called, I'm sure you recognize it, the European Union. And I'm telling you that it can be easily seen that never has there been such an empire of nations in Europe. History has never had this happen before. Without a doubt, the European Union of today is that final last day's empire of the Antichrist. Now, it doesn't look like it, perhaps, but it will. I tell the people this way, it is either the final empire or the beginning of what will become the final empire, the one that the Antichrist will rule. An often quoted statement made by a guy named Paul Henri Spock, the former Belgian prime minister who was one of the key leaders in forming the European Union back in the 50s when it first got started, made this statement. Listen carefully to what it says. I believe it clearly depicts the people of Europe today. He said, we do not want another committee. We have too many already. What we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold the allegiance of all people and to lift us out of the economic morass in which we are sinking. Send us such a man, and be he God or the devil, we will receive him. Well, there is a man coming, and he's not going to be God. He's going to claim to be God, but he's not God. He is the Antichrist. He's a counterfeit. And so that's going to happen in Europe probably a lot sooner than most of us realize. Let's go on to another one. In Revelation chapter 13, the Bible tells us that during the tribulation, actually around the middle part of the tribulation, a guy that we refer to as the false prophet. Now, he's the most senior subordinate right under the Antichrist. 
He will have a statue built of the Antichrist and placed in the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. And then he will demand that all the people on this planet bow down and worship the Antichrist and or his statue. And those who refuse will be executed. And then he will impose a system to identify all people who are loyal to the Antichrist and consequently all those who are not loyal to the Antichrist and his empire. How will he do this? Well, he will cause every person on this entire planet to receive a mark of loyalty to the Antichrist. Now, I said a mark of loyalty. You may re recognize it if I said a mark of the beast because that's the way it's referred to in the book of Revelation. The mark will be placed either on the right hand or on the forehead of every person who devotes themselves, commits themselves to the Antichrist and his empire. And those who do not do that will not be able to buy or sell anything, the Bible says, which obviously that would make it very hard to buy food or to have food because you wouldn't be able to buy or sell anything. Now remember, all this hasn't happened yet because it happens when? At the middle of the tribulation. And we're not in the tribulation yet, praise God, and we won't be as Christians, as I said. The Lord's coming for His people before He starts this program of the tribulation. But what I want you to see is that the technology that's needed for that kind of system to be operational is here now. Now, see, your parents and grandparents lived in a time where they couldn't conceive of how one person could, could number everybody in the world and control the whole planet that way. But with today's technology, it's quite easy to see it. You and I have, in fact, lived to see the use of electronic scanners that identify every single product in the store, right? Right? And then by scanning your debit card, the price of your purchase item is instantaneously deducted from your account at the bank and credited to the store's account. No passing of paper, no cash. Does anybody still write checks at the store? <laughs> You're so old-fashioned. Yeah. And nowadays, when you write the check, they put it in a little machine and just hand it back to you. So what's the point in writing it? You know, it seems kind of senseless. And so somehow, some way, the, the, the Antichrist is going to use, I think, that mark of loyalty to also be a part of a sales transaction to buy or sell something. And I'm going to talk again. I, I keep telling you about things we're going to be looking at, but I'm going to be talking about that some this week too. Today people play with what? Debit cards or credit cards. Let me quickly say debit cards are not the mark of the beast, so don't worry about that. But what I am trying to bring your attention is something that has become so commonplace to us today that we tend to completely overlook it as modern technology pointing to the mark of the beast. Something leading us right into that time where the system will already be in place and all he has to do is take control of it. One of the disadvantages of debit cards, of course, is that they can be lost or stolen. So they're not really a good form of identification that the person that's using the debit card is actually the real owner of the debit card. So eventually the same kind of information that's on that debit card that identifies you as the owner of that bank account is going to be placed in some other way on the right hand or on the forehead maybe a subdominal electronic chip. Some of you looking at me like a calf looking at a new gate. What is he talking about? Hang with me. Just 
give me a chance this week to explain all this. Or as my friend that I can do it, would say, give me a chance to explain this to you. Well, I'm sure that you realize that subdermal chips are already available. They've been around for quite a long time. They've been used for identity in high security areas, especially by the military. And um, they've been used for a lot of other things, for tracking animals, you know, real expensive animals like racehorses and stuff like that. They chip them so they'll always know where they are if they get out or get lost or get stolen. Well, I'm sure you realize that that's been the case for some time. Initially, these chips, these electronic chips, were called passive chips because really all they did was send out a little signal that could be converted to a number. And then they would look that number up in a central data bank somewhere in the country, and it would tell you about, you know, the animal or whoever has that chip. But today, scientists are working on subdermal transponder chips that will actually have some very amazing and quite scary capabilities such as making purchases and GPS locations continually, 24-7. Boy, you talk about gov government control. If every person had a chip and the government knew exactly where you are every second of your life, that is coming. It's coming. And so things are moving ahead very quickly. Technology is not, is not increasing on a straight line increase. It increases on what we call an exponential curve. It's like this. And so with the passage of time, at first, it didn't increase very much. But as we got further and further along in time, now, over a short period of time, technology is going straight up. Listen to what I'm telling you. Five years from now, if the Lord tarries that long, you're not going to believe what technology is doing. It's a very large subject. I wish we had time to talk more about it. But it comes and people, we receive it so acceptingly because it's convenient. Right? I mean, how many people carry a computer in their pocket? A purse. You know, we all have cell phones. I went to the... Uh, place where there was a repair shop because I had something I needed fixed on my phone that I couldn't fix. And the guy was going through all these maneuvers with this thing and I couldn't believe what he was doing. And I said, well, what about that? And what about that? And what about that? And what about that? And he said, oh, you can do this and you can do that and you can do this. I said, man, I just want something I can call somebody on. Can I get that? Just pick it up and call. Well, it does that plus a million other things. That's technology that we totally accept. It's commonplace, right? In fact, I would say just about every adult in this room probably has a cell phone. Maybe not all. There are still a few holdouts out there, but not many. Another requirement for a worldwide system to track people and to control their buying and selling them would be, of course, a, a planetary financial infrastructure that connects all the banking institutions together. Guess what? It's already done. International banking communications and transfers are already established worldwide. We can go to Israel or any other country and I can pull out my credit card or whatever, go to an ATM machine, whatever I want to do, and get money. And it deducts it from my account in Derrida, Louisiana. So international banking is here. It's not futuristic. And it, it, I mean, we're not just talking about you know, within a nation. We're talking about from nation to nation, around the planet, anywhere. You can go to China. 
and get money out of your bank account right here. The basic infrastructure for that system is established. The one thing that is not is that there has to be an overruling authority that controls the whole infrastructure. Now, that hasn't happened, but the Antichrist will do that. He will do that. Now, listen, I know all of this probably sounds like some kind of futuristic sci-fi movie to a lot of people, but it's not. The technology for the subdermal chips, that's already here. A cashless society that uses digital currency is coming. We're using it already, but soon it's going to be your national currency. I definitely want to talk about that some this week. Pretty soon you can take your $100 bills and light your fireplace with it because it would be worth zero. All money will be digital. That's going to happen. A worldwide banking network to monitor, record, and control every sales transaction in the world? That's a pretty big computer system, right? No, they can do it with a laptop. The infrastructure for that is already here. Most of this technology is here, or at least it's very, very close. In addition to these prophecies, now let me just touch on some more things just very rapidly. There are other things that show the signs of our day that Jesus is coming. The Bible tells us that in the very last days there will be a great apostasy. The word means a falling away. There will come, you say, well, there's always been apostasy in the church. Sure, there has. But this one will be so massive, so many people falling away from the truth of God's word that it will be unlike any other time in all of history because of so many people turning their back on God. Guess what? We're already in it today. And if you can't see that, obviously you hadn't watched the religious programs on TV very much. This time of apostasy is here. We are living in the day of great apostasy. And as I've already mentioned, the Bible says in Daniel 12:4 that, that technology will suddenly just skyrocket. You know, according to the scriptures, you know, mankind has only been on the earth around 6,000 years. Don't listen to the stupid scientists that say we've been here millions of years. We've only been here about 6,000 years. For the first 5,900 of those years, the number one form of transportation was either walking or riding on a horse. Some of you say, boy, I wish I could go back to those days. <laughs> Not me. I kind of like the luxury of riding in a car. It's only been in the last century of the last 6,000 years that technology and transportation has turned skyward. So now, not only have we put men on the moon, with transportation, with rocket ships. But now even private, private-owned space organizations like Mr. Elon Musk and his space ventures are doing things that we never thought were possible. I know I'm kind of chasing a rabbit here, but you remember when they put the men on the moon and all of, every day since then, the rockets were disposable. The main thrust rockets carried that spaceship into outer space and then they broke away and they were, they were finished. They were done. They just fell back to the earth and destroyed, right? Mr. Musk's organization, I don't know if you saw this, just recently shot some spaceship into the earth and when the, when the rockets broke loose, they came back, and they came right back to where they left from, and they came down and sat down on the ground. Perfect order. Can be totally refueled and reused for another flight. Now, that's going a long ways with technology. I've got to finish. The Bible says natural disasters are going to increase in the last days. Luke 21 talks about the powers of heaven shall be shaken. I believe this is a reference to destructive weather patterns. 
And there's a lot of good statistical information out there that shows that things like hurricanes and tornadoes and those things are on the increase. Matthew 24 says that there will be a great increase in famines and pestilence and earthquakes. By the way, you understand what the word pestilence means, right? It means widespread disease, a pandemic. Yeah, COVID wasn't the last one. It was probably the first one. There will be many more like it coming in the days to come, especially during the tribulation, which, praise God, we're not going to be here to deal with. But natural disasters like these will become more, more intense and closer together. The Bible says that in the very last days, it's the Jews, Israel, will, be, will possess the, their home city of Jerusalem once again. Well, if you don't keep up with history, that happened back in 1967. A little war they called the Six-Day War on June 7, 1967. Israel took control of Jerusalem, and she controls it to this day. And all the negotiations with the Palestinians and their attempt to try to get East Jerusalem away from Israel and count that as their capital city, they've gotten nowhere. The one thing that Israel will not budge on in their negotiations, they will not give up one inch of Jerusalem. All the prime ministers have declared that. So Jerusalem belongs to Israel. It's their eternal capital. And the Palestinians or the Arabs can whine and moan all they want to about getting the eastern half of the city for their capital. It ain't going to happen. There are many more prophecies. I'm going to stop right here. But there are many more prophecies that deal with society and with religion and with governments that you know we haven't even mentioned here this morning. But the list is too long. The topic is way too far for us to cover in one setting. But hopefully I've given you a good representative sampling of some of the things that are happening that for the most part people are ignorant of, especially in the church. And you would think if anybody would recognize the importance of these things, it would be God's people. But they're not. And this proves that even though we can't pinpoint the day of the Lord's return, we can most certainly say that we're living in the season of His return. And so that's the basis of this message. But here's the real point. So what are you going to do with this information? Now, you don't have to answer that to me. But as one philosopher said, to thine own self be true. Answer it to yourself. What are you going to do with this information? You've heard about it. You know it's going. And it all points to the imminent return of Christ. So what are you going to do with that? You see, most people today are like the rich farmer. They just go on with their life doing what they always do without any concern about who God is or what God is doing or what He expects from us. And God is sending all of these signs pointing to His return, and like the rich farmer, most people are simply ignoring the facts. Even those that know about it, do not respond to it. And consequently, I think that maybe God must be looking down from heaven with a real scowl upon His face and saying, You fool! You're going to leave this earthly life soon, and then who is all that stuff that you're accumulating? Who's it going to benefit then? There are many people today who are laying up treasures for themselves but are not rich towards God. Amen. And so this morning I exhort you, if you are a true born-again Christian, I would ask you this question. Okay, so what are you doing for the kingdom of God? If you had to stand before your Lord today, would He look at you and say, Well done, thou good and faithful sermon or servant, or would you 
have to bow your head in shame and say, well, Lord, I guess I didn't do very much. Whatever you're going to do for Christ, I'm telling you this, you better get on with it, Christians. Time is running out. If you have some unsaved people in your family, you care anything at all about their eternal welfare, stop procrastinating. Go see them, call them, meet with them, bug them if you have to to talk to you and let you share with them the gospel. If you're not a true born again believer in Jesus Christ, if you've never truly given your life to Him, asking Him to forgive you of your sins and give you eternal life, then I'm telling you that right now is the time you need to do that because even before I finish this sentence, Jesus could take us out of this world. We are that close. It could happen at any second. If you're not a born-again believer, you will not be taken out. You'll be left behind to face the Antichrist in the tribulation. Don't be like the rich farmer, ignoring the facts. And everything that I've shared with you, even though it was very brief, is easily supported by the Word of God. I don't have any problem whatsoever taking you to Scripture, to Scripture, to Scripture, showing you that what I've just said is true. I can just pull this out of the air somewhere. God said, God said, and you mark it down when God says it's going to happen. You ready? If you're not, then I would invite you today, get ready. Don't, don't put it off. Quit making sorry excuses and just say yes to Jesus. If you're not saved, then you better get on your knees and ask God to save you. If you are saved but you're not really living for the Lord like you know you should, then now's the time to make the change. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we'll confess our sins, that God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, hey, let's get on the ball. Let's confess. Lord, I've got sin in my life, and I'm confessing it. And I want you to forgive me and give me the power over that sin to turn from it so that I can be a real instrument in your hands. Because I'm going to tell you this, folks, and this is a little owl theology more than biblical theology, but God doesn't use dirty instruments. choice is up to us. Each one. Would you bow your head? Father, for me, and I, I don't claim to know a lot, Lord, but for me, it's so obvious. It's so clear and plain of what you're doing. And all of it says that you're coming soon for your people. And that excites me. It also makes me want to do more for the kingdom. And Lord, there's a lot of people in this world like the rich farmer who are just so consumed by their own little world, their own kingdom building of themselves that they really don't give much thought to what you think, say or what you're expecting from us. And Lord, I pray that at least in this room and these among these people that, Lord, everyone will be careful to search their heart and say, am I really living my life believing that Jesus is about to come? And Lord, if we're not, then help us to repent and get busy for Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your word again. Help us throughout the week, dear God, as we study it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me, please, quietly and reverently right where you are? 
Brother Blaine's going to come here in the front. Maybe, maybe something that's been said here this morning has kind of shaken your awareness a little bit. Kind of said, hey, this is not just the same old routine where you go to church and you, you know, you hear the preacher and you sing some songs and you go home and you forget about it. This, it's too late for living that kind of life. We can't afford that anymore. So maybe, maybe today you'd like to get on track with Jesus again. You've probably done it before. I've done it many times where I kind of stray a little bit, you know, get off the path and I have to get on my knees and say, God, get me back in the game again. So maybe that's where you are this morning. I want to invite you just come and make a fresh commitment to Christ. And if you're not saved, that's the first thing you want to do is just ask God to save you. But whatever God's telling you to do, don't put it off. Don't procrastinate. You say, well, I'll do it tonight or later the, during the week. Or, but you don't know what's going to happen before tonight or later in the week. Do it now while the time is available while you're here. So as the music plays, I'm going to just ask you, if you will, just to make your way. If you want to come and commit your heart to Christ and tell the pastor about it, or if you just want to come to the altar here and just pray and say, Lord, I got to get, I got to get back in the game. I got to get back on the team again. I would invite you to do it this morning while there's still time. If you don't mind, we'll just play some music. And if you ladies and guys will play. The invitation is now open. If God's spoken to you, would you come? Don't put it off. I'll be, be praying for you. I, I don't know who you are, but no doubt there's someone here today that God's dealing with. And I want to pray for you. Y'all come as God speaks. Sometimes people ask me questions like this. They'll say, well, Brother Al, you was here last year, and you was preaching the same thing last year, and he didn't come. You know what I say? That just means we're one year closer to him coming because it's going to happen. It could happen today or sometime this next 12 months. I don't know. But he said, when you see these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your head for your redemption draws nigh. I, I, I tell you plainly, we're seeing it begin to happen. We're past, it's past the beginning. It's been going on for some time. Well, thank you so much for your attendance to this morning and, and pray that the message has uh, stirred your heart a little bit. Maybe God is speaking to you and you'd still like to make that decision. Listen, I'm here. Pastor's here. Brother Ellis is here. We'd be glad to talk with you, pray with you. But God's speaking to you. Um, Six o'clock tonight, 
right, Brother Blaine? Six o'clock tonight in the fellowship hall. And uh, so it's going to be a, a different setting than what we have here. The reason we move it over there is because it's going to be, uh, I guess you'd say, less formal. I mean, while I'm talking, you want to get up and go get a cup of coffee or something, that's fine, you know. Even as I'm talking, if you have a question or a comment to make, you just say, hey, preacher, I, you know, and we can stop and discuss. It's more like a classroom type thing rather than me doing all the talking like in a sermon. So, okay? So I think you'll enjoy it from that aspect. And some of the things we've talked about in here this morning, and we're, I'm going to go back to and give you far more information on it. And there's some things that I haven't said anything about yet that we are definitely going to talk about. Uh, one of them I hope we get to is uh, the Battle of Gog of Magog, Ezekiel 38 and 39, because I think the war in Ukraine could play a part in that. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. <laughs> okay? So y'all come back tonight. Let's have a good time studying God's Word together. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, Pastor. Bless you. 